A champion is bred from hard times, scarred mind standing on the ledge. The squad grind all time, victory in spite of opposition. Welcome to competition. You pick a side, I pick a side, they pick a side. Take a knee against abuse, they rather you die. Pushing through dark tunnels, trying to shed light. The fight is on the moment we enter the game of life. Get it right for the whole thing, gone dead. Let's go ahead and take it there. Meet me on the edge. Now's the part of the show where we talk to a sports scholar about their area of research. Uh, our first sports scholar is Travers, a professor at Simon Fraser University and a sports trailblazer in their own right. And we will talk about that. Travers, how are you? I'm great, Dave. Great to see you. I'm, I'm so thrilled that you're on the show. Um, so first and foremost, what sport and what angle on that sport is your primary area of sports scholarship? Um, I have to say it's baseball because I'm obsessed with baseball, but I, I write generally about sport and social justice with special emphasis on gender and race. Mm. Now, you've also become somewhat of an expert on an issue that's roiling the United States, which is the issue of whether trans kids will have access to sports. Uh, and you've been called upon to be an expert on this issue in, in many spheres, and your voice is so welcome given the, the level of attacks. What do you have to say about the hundreds of bans? And I think it's almost 500 now that are in legislative state houses that have been put forward aimed at trans kids to stop them from playing sports, with an emphasis, of course, on trans girls and young women. It's really horrifying. Um, it just shows the the extent to which the Christian right is willing to go to kind of consolidate a, a power base. Um, but I try to be a little bit optimistic, which is difficult in this context, in that if trans social movements and our supporters had not been so successful in creating uh, more space for trans people of all ages, this would not be happening. There's a really concerted effort by right-wing organizations to push us back out of public space. And sport is one of the areas that they seem to be having the most success. Mm. And, and what do you say to people who are generally on the side of the angels when it comes to issues about social justice? And I'm sure you've met people like this. They even say they support trans rights. But then when it comes to sports, they say, now, now, now. I don't know. I think it's important that we keep things the way they are and not make space for trans kids. What do you say to them? Because I'm sure you've come across that type of person in your time. I have. And I think that the the ignorance about the history of sport and the way in which sport normalizes gender inequality needs to be attended to. The idea that there are only two sexes and that uh, there is a neat dividing line between those sexes, that's an ideology rather than a scientific fact. And sport is one of the key cultural arenas that normalizes the idea that men and women and boys and girls are fundamentally different and that, you know, men are superior at sport. So when people raise issues around trans participation, particularly the participation of trans girls and women, uh, people don't really have uh, the information or the viewpoint to to understand these issues from a critical context, which is why education is so important. Mm. Now, now, I mentioned at the start that you are a sports trailblazer. And you, so you're not just somebody who teaches about these issues. You're, you're out there in the mix. And I'm hoping you could speak about what trail you have blazed uh, in the world of sports. And since it's baseball, a sport that you love that that in a lot of ways for me as an observer makes it all the sweeter that you found a place there uh how are you a sports trailblazer well i've been coaching baseball since my daughter was in little league she's now 18 um wow. and i coached my son from age nine all the way up to 12 but last year i was made head coach of an 18u triple a baseball team uh and i am sure that I am the first non-man to head coach at that level in Canada, if not the United States. I have yet to, to hear of somebody who has been head coach at that level. So as you can imagine, it's really challenging to be the first, but I love baseball so much. And to be able to coach a team with players who can really play well, it, it's very exciting. And what is the greatest challenge in doing this work as a non-man? Well, if I were to show up 
you know, white bearded with a bear gut, everybody would assume that I knew what I was doing. Whereas I have to show that I do. So there's an incredible uh, pressure to prove my competence rather than um, prove my incompetence, which is what typically men have the opportunity to do. They're assumed to be competent until proven otherwise. Whereas I make a mistake and it's like, whoa. And the thing is, I am going to make mistakes. We all make mistakes because we're learning. And if we're in our best environment, we're at the edge of our abilities. So if I make a mistake, I feel like the um, the consequences are so heavy. Whereas my male assistant coach, it, he doesn't have to. So it's a real challenge because I'm carrying so much pressure and yet you want to be relaxed and you want to be really mm. present with players. So those two things sometimes go against each other. But uh, this is my second year. I learned so much in the in the first year. But, you know, at times I do come home and I shake my head and I think, why am I doing this? It's so hard. But the pull for me with baseball and with coaching is so strong. And I love it so much that I, I do keep going. Absolutely. It's, it's love that's at the root of your burden. So... What do you love about baseball? I love the strategy. I love the base running game. I love good defense. I mean, I've got I've got a ten dollar bill on the clipboard of my my team's lineup that goes to you know the next person who lays out and makes a play. We we got it up to thirty dollars last weekend, you know, because after every series of games, another ten goes on it, and it was really cool to see a player who. Um, He's a really good player, but he wasn't being aggressive enough in the outfield. And so we've been working with him on that. He laid out. He made the play. It was an incredible play, really instrumental in winning that game. And I handed the money over. And those moments, those are fantastic. Or having a pitcher who's been having trouble attacking the zone, sending him in and watching him do it, you know, and standing next to my assistant coach going, I want this so much for him. And then seeing him do it, it's like, and the look on his face when he came off the field, it's hard not to love. Wow. Now, now I want to just finish up by asking you a question that I gave you no prep for. So in advance, I do apologize. Uh, I wanted to know if you could recommend one book at this intersection of sports and scholarship that you think people should read. And before you answer, and I guess this is me of uh, vamping a little bit to give you a second to think about it. Just hearing you talk makes me think about a book that's near and dear to my heart called Stolen Bases, Why American Girls Don't Play Baseball, uh, which is an incredible book about the socialization of softball and the original players of baseball who, no who numbered women among them, among the original players. And there was this tradition that sort of got hijacked. So I, I recommend that book by Jennifer Ring, uh, Stolen Bases, Why American Girls Don't Play Baseball. Ball in your court, which I think is a mixed sports metaphor, Travers. Uh, what, what, what is your book of choice? Well, I might have mentioned Stolen Bases because that is an outstanding. Oh, I did that to help. <laughs> you know, as somebody who teaches uh, sport and society courses, I would recommend Tony Collins' 2013 book, A History of Modern Sport. I believe that's the title. You can get it as a free PDF, which I also love. But what it does is it situates the emergence of modern sport uh, with the emergence of capitalism and, and actually makes the argument that you don't have one without the other. And the way that they, they developed synergistically. And certainly some of the material is out of date because it was published in 2013. But this, the historical emergence of modern sport and the relationship between gambling, et cetera, and you know, why sport developed the way that it did, I think it's really helpful for us to understand sport in its current context. And I love that you can get it as a PDF. So Tony Collins, I believe it's history of modern sport or something like that. And I, that's a really good one. Uh, for Google purposes, is that T-O-N-I or T-O-N-Y? T-O-N-Y. Okay, gotcha. And uh, wow, uh, as we said earlier in the program, I mean, pro sports, it's bigger than U.S. Steel. So we, we better have a, an analysis of it that takes in questions of capitalism or we're, we're just not there. Exactly. Uh, wow, Travers, Professor Travers. Travers, uh, just Travers. Thank you so much for joining us here on The Edge of Sports. It's my pleasure, Dave.
Thank you so much for watching The Real News Network, where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work. So please, tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. Solidarity forever.